this panel is the termed wellbeing panel for LGBTIQA. Uh, I think this panel is very, very important. Uh, when we look in relation to the Youth 2000 survey series, which all of you have received in your pack. So we'll be referring to some of the statistics in this today uh, for a lot of the questions because they are very pivotal to who we are and what we are as a, as a community and our, our weaknesses per se and our wellbeing. So of course you guys all know me, I'm Sophie. Uh, I don't need to ex expand on <laughs> what I do or whatever, you pretty much all know me now. Um, I kind of define wellbeing as uh, something that is beyond just mental. Uh, I see it as a physical, a spiritual, and, and everything else that encompasses who I am as a person. Uh, what I really would like for us to do uh, for this panel is to not make it so that we are talking at you. We're gonna make sure that you are part of our discussion. So the questions that I asked the panelists after they um, answered, finish answering the question, we would really like to throw it into you guys mm -hmm. to see uh, what you guys think about these questions and how we could possibly team together to create some social change. So to begin with, I would like three people to raise their hands and I would love for you guys to define well-being for yourselves as a person. So would anybody like to volunteer to define how, what well-being means to them? Piva, go for it. Um, physical? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else like to have a go? You could also think of like, you know, drugs and alcohol as well being part of that. Uh, H, what, what do you think? Awesome. Yeah, Andrew? I, I think for me it's, it, it is sort of that balance between uh, being in my comfort zone, uh, be comfortable, uh, be challenged, and be self defined or something or more importantly self aware. Awesome. Thank you so much for volunteering to say something about well being. Uh, so that we are recognitioning the Youth 2000. Um, just be aware that, I'm just gonna give a content warning now that we will touch on stuff that is very, very characteristic of all of us. I know that a lot of us have been through mental health issues. We've been put in uh, situations of being bullied, abuse, and we will be touching on that. Uh, the safe room, everybody knows, is up the stairs in the Marae, and if you just grab either Tuvai or Robbie, uh, they will be very happy to you know, sit up with, there with you if you don't feel comfortable talking about some of this stuff, because it will be a trigger, possibly. So just putting that out there. So I'm gonna introduce my panelists. So we've got Marnie and Renee and Harriet, and they're going to introduce themselves. Marnie. <laughs> okay, so starting um, some declarations first. I'm an intersex person. Um, I've struggled with the effects of childhood trauma all my life, so I've been officially diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And health and wellness of, in the community is a passion of mine, but in our community particularly. And you know, when I look at the report and, and see those stats, I get sad, and then I look around this room and I get excited. And we'll, we'll be talking more about that today because the world out there is not going to give us our health. It's not. We give ourselves our health, and that's about, first of all, feeling that we are worthy of that. So I'll talk a lot more about that this afternoon, but it's amazing to be here, and thank you. Thanks, Marnie. Um, yeah, um, as has been said, my name's Renee. 
Um, it's kind of special to be invited to be part of this panel. Um, I, I'm a uh, lesbian woman and I've identified as a lesbian since I was about 17. Um, I'm also a mum, I have two lovely boys that are 11 and 4. Um, and I began my professional career working at Rainbow Youth, which is why it's kind of nice to be back here. Um, always kind of focused on evidence-based practice. I did my thesis on the effectiveness of um, Rainbow Youth workshops in reducing homophobia for secondary school students. Um, so that was quite a, a nice chunk of work that provided some information for funding for a wee while after that. Um, throughout my kind of professional um, career, um, I've got to a place where I work with the high and complex needs young people, so I'm still working with you. Um, and I was talking with Marnie earlier how um, I'd forgotten how fabulous, um, well internally resourced young people are. Um, talking with you guys and, and seeing you here, um, I forget how awesome young people are um, that are at the other end of the scale. So yeah, it, it's really great to be in a room where um, I guess I'm sitting with a whole lot of uh, active young people who are going to make a difference in our society. Um, hi, I'm Harriet and my kind of major passion area is youth mental health. Um, I think it's a really important time when a person's ability to develop, uh, to um, roll with change and kind of look after their own mental health is developing and so I think it's a great access point. Um, and I like working at kind of the beginning of the story in the prevention stages, so that's um, where my current work is. Um, but I've also been um, interested in the trauma that can lead to um, someone having been, becoming unwell. And so my background prior to this has been um, working with people in the more trauma states that have left them in a place, in a bad place. So. Um, I wanted to get back to the beginning and get to people before they end up um, in a bad place. So that's where I'm sort of coming from. Awesome. So the first question that I'm going to ask the three panellists is how do they define wellbeing? Uh, just to get some perspective on where they come from in terms of their experiences where they might have a different definition of well-being. So, Marnie, what do you think well-being? Great, just a minor techie thing. We've got an echo going on here, which is fine, because echoes are cool, but if you <laughs> don't want an echo, we're going to need to adjust the mics. Cool. <laughs> so what I didn't say before, um, I'm a mental health professional as well. I, I'm a counsellor. Um, I have a small private practice, but I also run an organisation raising awareness around intersex issues, which I am myself. And when I think about what, what health is, what wellness is, it's often, in, in my profession, you know, the absence of illness. So I, I think what I'd like to do now is, is let's just throw it open to the group. So I can think for me, being healthy is the presence of laughter. So mm. On the floor? <laughs> yeah, we'll shout it out. Sorry? Glitter. Glitter. <laughs> Being grounded. Being grounded. Smiling. Smiling. Family. Family. Food. Food. <laughs> Sexy. <laughs> Yogurt. Yogurt. <laughs> right, sleeping reasonably well. <laughs> <laughs> Going for adventures. Going for adventures. Yes. Connected. So, you know, we're starting to put some t texture into it. So I think wellness is quite a complicated thing and it's a highly individual thing. So what makes me feel well and, and am well is probably different from yours, mm -hmm. subtly. How do you follow on from yeah. that? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I guess one thing that, um, when I was thinking about wellness and what wellness means, um, I totally acknowledge that it is different for different people and it's also different um, for different cultures, um, what happiness is or what wellness is I should say. Um, something that really stood out for me though was that um, the, a really p big part was the interconnectedness you have with your world around you, with your friends, where do you belong, who do you have connections with, who are you accepted by, who are you rejected by, what is your worth. Do you respect others? Do others respect you? So they were some of the questions that were important um, for me to be able to answer when I think of wellness. Um, I always see wellness and sort of mental wellbeing on a spectrum very much, and that 
Um, a lot of the work I've been doing recently is around mental health or wellness being quite a separate thing that only some people have and generally the unwell people have. Um, and so I see it as very much a part of everyone's lives and everyone moves along a spectrum at different times. Um, and I see wellness as being in a comfortable, sort of like you were saying, H, like a balanced place for yourself um, and being able to carry out the day-to-day -day things that you think are important and, and keep you happy. Awesome. So we're going to go on to another question as well for all of you, and it is in relation to the uh, Youth 2000 uh, statistics. Although we are smarter, um, <laughs> it, <laughs> yes, it has been uh, found that LGBT, uh, I'm going to add IQA on the end of that, uh, although I'm just going to put, you know, a warning that only the statistics in here are for LGBT, unfortunately not for the IQ and the A, which is really unfortunate, but I'm sure more research will be hopefully publicised uh, for the IQ and the A. Uh, that the LGBT students have a lower emotional wellbeing rating, a greater long-term health problems, greater chances of self-harming and considering suicide, and greater bullying incidents. I could, I could literally go on about these statistics all day. Um, especially when compared to their heterosexual counterparts. So the question is that, uh, do you think that we, as a community, are able to change these statistics? If so, how shall we change them? Harriet. <laughs> of course we can change them. Um, very optimistic about social change, that it's always possible. Um, how, I think, it is a slow process and it needs people working in all different areas. Um, I see a lot of these issues to be quite institutionalised and they run just in the background of everything that we do day to day and um, so stuff like that takes a lot of work to change. Um, but I, I mean, like the work I'm doing in schools at the moment, I can already see, especially like starting with young people, so we might not be able to change older generations, but um, working with young people, they're so eager um, to do things about these issues because it is around them all the time and they're dealing with them and they want to get out there and do stuff. So I've found um, the young people I'm working with just really want to be a voice for people who don't feel they've got a voice at that point in time. Um, and so I'm very optimistic that we... <laughs> I'm changing, I'm gonna change things with them. Yeah. Um, I'm absolutely optimistic. And um, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. You look at how far we've come so far, so we know that the ball is just rolling and that we are uh, just going to change further and further as time goes on. Um, when, to kind of throw it back to you guys, when you look at these stats, um, and some of them are pretty shocking and they've been there for many years, um, why are we experiencing some of these stats? Why do we have increased bullying? Why do we have increased self-harm, suicidal ideation? How come? Why do you think? There's no right or wrong answer. Because we're different. Yep, because we're different. Robbie? Just similar to that, do you think the availability of information affects the, the increase in self-harm? Like being aware of what self-harm is mm. and why people do it. You know, so if you, you read about people cutting themselves and why they do it, you know, I feel like that too and they'll help me. Oh, there is a correlation between that, yep. Yeah. Yes. But, but when you look at why these stats are there, we can kind of broaden them into some categories maybe. And, and there seems like an, an, it's like a slap in the face that we can see if we target schools and we keep targeting schools and that's happening thanks to 
you know, what you've been talking about, what Rainbow Youth is doing, um, that we're going to make a difference there. Um, I think we can think big. We can think national strategy. We can think about what institutions do we need to change. We need to tackle our parents' generation. So how do we do that? Um, maybe they can be instrumental in telling us how that could happen. Um, but if we think big and think national strategy uh, and break it down into smaller parts, we can definitely make a change. Absolutely. So when we look at the stats, one of the things that's very easy to get misled that there's something flawed and wrong with us as a community. Mm. Actually, all those stats tell us is what's wrong with society. Those statistics are a result of living in a community where we are invisibilised, where there is bullying, where there isn't appropriate access to the resources that people need, where we have families that disown us. They are simply an accumulation of all that, and, and the stats that we're getting are not the whole picture. So there are groups missing in these stats, but also I don't think at the moment that they are an accurate reflection because people's fear in terms of um, actually saying what's going on. Can we change it? Absolutely. We change it by creating communities that support and care. So all the work that you are doing here in, in this room and other people are doing, that's what will change things. And I think the other thing, reaching a place where we go, actually we're entitled to live healthy, well, joyful lives with all of those cool things that you were saying before and not be silent about it. Those stats have to reverse for all marginalised communities. And I think that's the other piece of this, is working with the other groups in society who are invisible, who also have bad stats, and just going, no, it's not OK for the most privileged people in New Zealand to be well. We all deserve to live happy, healthy lives. So we have to get noisy and stroppy and grumpy and get out there and get what every single person is entitled to as a human right. Awesome. So now specifically talking about uh, alcohol, smoking and drugs, um, Renee has luckily focused her, um, like, a, like ugh, gosh, focused on um, service models and development within alcohol and drug and mental field, um, mental health issues uh, in her fields of practice. Uh, so specifically for your, uh, a question for you, uh, when we examine these statistics, um, although they are, they are not representative of all of us, uh, it is seen that the LGBT students are more likely to be subjected to substance abuse. Uh, how can we create a more inclusive uh, support networks that focus on alcohol and drugs mm. uh, in order to change these particular statistics around substance abuse mm. in our community? For me, I think there's kind of a two-pronged approach. Mm -hmm. When you look at the other stats in, um, to do with self-harm and depression um, and suicidal ideation and stuff, it makes complete sense that we have um, skewed stats around alcohol and drug use. Uh, when New Zealand culture as a society, when a young person reaches their teenage years, it's absolutely okay to get shit-faced often. And so when you've got a young person that's not feeling okay about themselves, um, is constantly having uh, their own narratives going on in their head and not feeling okay about things um, when they start drinking or using drugs and suddenly they feel a little bit numb, they feel a little bit okay, the world's a little bit of a better place, it makes complete sense that our stats are skewed um, and we find it in other um, groups, um, be it Māori or Pacific um, Island groups and stuff like that for the same reasons, for some because it just feels kind of good to be a bit, little bit numb and um, when you practice being numb for long enough then alcohol and drug use becomes a habit. Um, at, the, at the other side, you, you will know from your own experience in the community that using drugs and alcohol is really fun. You have lots of fun when you're out of it, generally. There's a dark side to it, but let's face it, it's pretty fun. So when you've got a young person who is coming out and is starting to mix in the gay and lesbian community, 
where actually it's heaps more acceptable for a 16-year-old kid to hang out with a 25-year-old because they're all youth um, and that's okay. Where in general, in general situations, that's not okay. So if you were in a, a, in a heterosexual environment, a 16-year-old and a 25-year-old probably wouldn't be hanging out together socially. Um, but suddenly it is, so you've got that whole developmental phase where um, young people are exposed to things where they wouldn't probably be exposed to them until a little bit later. Um, also, we look at our, um, what activities are there for um, gay and lesbian, bi, transgender, and sex coming out. Um, lots of them probably include drugs and alcohol, dancing, having a whole lot of fun. If I think of, say, uh, uh, something, something that's not a usual pastime, say stamp collecting. Say you're a stamp collector and you go, I really want to meet other people who are stamp collectors. Um, I want to learn um, about stamp collecting. I want to maybe find a little love connection, someone who's a stamp collector. Pretty sure they're not going to be meeting at a bar, getting off their face and having a really good time. But in our communities, often they are. So yeah, probably not too many stamp collectors. Bit of a, a, a I guess, a, a, a primitive analogy, but you kind of get where I'm coming from. So, so how do we provide alternative activities that, get, that are going to engage young people and be fun um, and aren't centred around drugs and alcohol? Is it, I don't know, a stand-up paddleboarding morning? Is it, you know, there's a new um, massive room in Greyland that's all trampolines. Do we have a massive gay trampoline morning there? You know, being a little bit creative and having it regular so that people are being active, um, connecting with each other without drugs and alcohol. What do other people think? What are your thoughts? And you know, um, I was in, in Amsterdam a, a few years ago and I didn't know my way around at all and my partner and I were looking for the gay bars, which we asked a policeman on the street, do you know where the gay bars are? And he said, of course I do, and he told us where they all were. <laughs> and then he said, oh, there's that one that's down there, and he yells out to another policeman, where's that other gay bar down there? And, you know, they all knew the information. And we rocked up to this gay bar that had two parts. One, everyone was sitting down playing board games. It was really bizarre. We didn't, yeah, we didn't know what was going on. And the other part, everyone was dancing. So yes, there was alcohol there, and yes, there were drugs there. Um, but that wasn't the primary connection people had with each other. They were doing stuff together. They were interacting. They were laughing. And lots of people weren't drinking there. Yeah. A lot of people feel that way as well. I know I've talked to numerous, like to a lot of you, I mean, I don't drink personally, and if personally it's a trigger for me, so, and I know that that would be, you know, maybe a trigger for you, or that you're just not comfortable being around people who drink, so that's why I'm almost a little bit disappointed in some of the queer groups that, you know, all the um, activities, specifically this is within the South Island, that it is based around drinking, and that there isn't that connection anymore, it's lost, so... Andrew, what have you got to say? Oh, just, just sort of adding to that, is that other spaces have been created uh, for those in the two queer communities. Um, there's an amazing theatrical group in Wellington called The Fit Theatre. Uh, yes. They're amazing. Uh, and like the last, last time I saw one of their plays, they were doing the vagina monologue. Mm. I think, 
Yeah. Mm. Wouldn't that be good as a, like a project, you know, around New Zealand setting up hubs yeah. that, you know, are a space, you know, that is, yeah, funded, mm. uh, you know, for like rent and stuff like that, mm. uh, that we could like have a place to actually stay uh, and like meet each other and everything like that. So yeah. just keep that in mind. Okay, I've got a, connect, uh, a question for Ren oh no, Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so this is just talking about support groups. Um, you, uh, if you were in the group one with me, I talked uh, briefly about our group Alphabet Soup that we created in uh, Dunedin, and we were really struggling getting in high schools because they feel like we're presenting the gay agenda onto their young children uh, and turning them all gay. So uh, in response to that... Um, <laughs> Uh, it is very evident that uh, that the LGBT support groups uh, and the strengthening of council services within high schools is is happening in some instances. However, it isn't in some of the parts of New Zealand um, who are struggling to get into high schools to promote support for LGBT students, even with the alarming statistics that we do show them. Uh, so. Harriet is awesome because she founded a project called Speak Out, and I'm sure she'll tell you all about it. Um, and what have, you been, what have been your key successes in gaining school engagement for your project? Well, so Speak Out is a project I started um, middle of last year, with um, thanks to the embassy, actually. Um, <laughs> so um, my aim is to basically reduce the stigma around, around mental health for young people with the hope that they'll access services um, sooner and that being a way to combat some of our horrific statistics in kind of all youth communities, but particularly in this community. Um, and so the, uh, the project is to have groups of six to eight young people in a school that effectively run sort of a committee or group and they will run six to eight initiatives throughout the year, promoting um, various kind of educational content, but more around creating a more inclusive school environment, and that being their kind of main role within a school. Um, so we're currently um, set up in five Auckland schools. We'll be adding five more schools this term, um, and then we've just also received funding for it to go for three years. Um, but I think around getting in, the key ways of getting into schools, um, schools were a lot more closed than I had anticipated, so I've learned, as Sophie has, this lesson, still learning it the hard way. Um, they are very scared of talking about any of these topics, and like just as Sophie was saying, that you're coming in to promote, like that I would come in and be promoting, talking about suicide, say schools are terrified, that you're gonna come in and talk about suicide and then it will put the idea into students' heads and things like that. So I think um, knowing the school communities you're going into first and knowing what programs they've already had and maybe what issues they've come across. So a lot of the schools I went to had um, been a part of the Yellow Ribbon campaign that was run a few years ago, and that encountered a lot of issues with that, so me coming in and talking about mental health was something that put a lot of schools off. But um, I think the main success I had was connecting with another group that was already in schools, um, the Peer Sexual Support Program, which runs just in Auckland currently. And um, they could see the need, um, and so they were happy to support me going into schools they were already in. And then once I was set up in a few schools, other schools were more like more happy to join in because they could see other schools were doing it, they were okay with it. It hadn't caused anyone to go and do anything crazy or, you know. Um, so I think getting, the, something I think the social sector is often um, not the best at is collaborating well enough. There is, um, and there are a lot of guidance councils mention this, that there's a lot of people coming to them with different programs and things they want to get in. And often they'll be quite similar as well. So connecting with the communities around the schools to find out sort of what they want and 
um, what's already worked and, and knowing where you're going into. Has anyone here been trying to get something into a school and, and struggling with that at all? Just Sophie? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What sort of issues have you been encountering? Yeah, that key person, yeah, definitely. Because you want, I guess, for them to gauge things and iron out stuff before you're needing to go to management and stuff. Yeah. Um, it's one from the students' perspective as well, having that connection that wasn't up as in the past, get back in the school from the board, having a little bit. Uh, yeah. And if it comes from them, then they have to listen more. Yeah. The other issue that I've found uh, quite prominent is that uh, once we do get into the schools and they show up for the group that we, you know, we talk to them about critical theory and stuff like that, we actually find it really, really difficult to be able to use them as a means to really get other people on board because, of course, they're young, they haven't came, come out yet, they are still testing the waters, they don't know really, it's quite hard to put that kind of a big weight on their shoulders to try to get a lot of more people to mobilise against mm -hmm. the board so and actually have a yeah. say. So that's what we've found in the past. <laughs> and I think, Tabby, you might... Do you find the same? Yeah. yeah. It is a lot of pressure on them. I mean, they're trying to go, with, go through things yeah. already. And, I mean, that's our biggest issue. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think... Um, I think young people like us going in and doing these things, we're just that bit older that we mm. can really advocate for the students to the boards and management, but we're still very connected to what's going on in high schools in a lot of ways, so, yeah. Awesome. So I've got another question for Harriet, and H, you definitely probably want to get in on this one. Uh, so this is about, uh, you know, speak out again, uh, which had an amazing conference uh, that we've all heard about, that H presented at. <laughs> Not given enough time, but that's all right. There's a lot of Clue 101 to go through. <laughs> um, so just uh, want to let everybody know, like, how has your project promoted aspects of, like, destigmatisation of mental illness and wellbeing um, for the queer community and in the high schools for that conference mm -hmm. and what you kind of plan to do in the future? Yeah. Um, well, we had H come and try and give a 101. Um, so I think just that first steps of education, I mean, I could see a lot of the students there. Um, this, it was new information for them and um, almost an empowering um, vibe from them to like be like, wow, we didn't know this information, now we do, this is great. Um, and then I think the whole project is looking at just to make, bring back community into schools almost and create a more inclusive culture. Um, so into our planning is we want to do um, a few times a year like nationwide initiatives once we're in more schools that all the schools are doing together on certain issues and things. So I think that's one way we'd bring in um, 
specific kind of queer community based things. Um, and I guess, yeah, it'll be ongoing. It's ongoing planning at the moment. So um, definitely open to anyone who wants to get involved in doing that with us as well. Um, but I guess we're trying to come a bit more from a general inclusive um, point of view rather than um, going on to specific issues. And I think that's come out of schools not wanting you to come in and really be talking explicitly about suicide or explicitly about self-harm. So we're looking at more of a youth-friendly, almost lighter way of um, addressing the issue. Does anybody have any other comments that they want to make about uh, the topic of, of high schools and anything like that, or even say anything? Do you guys like to say anything about about that? Disabled persons? Uh, I haven't had any experience going into any um, special education yet. Uh, I think it's pro I definitely think it would be a hard one to get into and um, it's quite a protected often mm -hmm. community and I think like from what I'm doing I th our content would have to be quite adjusted as well. Um, but definitely down the line, I think, to say these things don't affect someone just because they have a disability is yeah. just mm. irrelevant. Yeah, yeah they're very, and I think a lot of, there's a lot of stigma around what someone with Asperger's or autism feels or thinks or how they, their relationships work as well, which is, there's quite a lot of misconception there mm. in itself, yeah. Yeah. Pima. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just actually, because I was talking to you about Mount Roskill, going into Mount Roskill, I found that very interesting. There's a. Um, really large, there's a huge mix in Mount Ross School, but there's been um, a lot of interest from the Indian students in what we're doing. Um, and a lot of what has come out from them is that mental health in their culture is not something that you talk about, and it's very shameful. And for them, there was a number of students where their parents had been through issues and the whole family has been shunned, or the, them themselves had been um, through a suicide attempt or something, and that led to the family being shunned. So um, I think for us, there's a lot of cultural work we need to do um, in our education and processing with this as well. Um, and then, of course, some, like, and then we're also very aware of the higher rates in Māori and Pacific 
um, cultures as well. Um, and then again in males as well with suicide. Um, so there's a lot of those sub-risk groups that as I get the kind of nuts and bolts running is, is where we'd like to access more. Um, I've, at the moment, the first five schools we got on board, it was the school councillors were facilitating the groups. Um, but I've run into a couple of safety issues with school councillors around that, um, with them wanting these students to become sort of peer councillors, basically. Um, and my feeling is that to be able to counsel like that, you need um, a lot of understanding around risk assessment and when what someone's telling you needs to be escalated or when it's just, you can just keep talking with them. So um, our next round of schools, the students are gonna be working with youth workers and so quite a different framework to with the counsellors. So it'll be interesting to see um, how that goes, yeah. Because um, when I was in high school, yeah. I would talk to my school counsellor about suicidal. Mm. And I was like, yeah, please. Yeah. And that is such a common story with guidance counsellors. Mm -hmm. And um, another piece of work I'd like to add to my list of things to work on is um, for young people to be able to self-refer to services as well, because a big yeah. issue when talking, when I talk to young people is you have to go through your counsellor or your GP. Well, this, the guidance counsellors don't have the time and resourcing for everyone that needs to be seen, and they tend to do stuff like that, call your parents. And GPs are generally associated with your families or there's just not a good relationship often with young people between their GPs. Um, so I'd really like to see young people being able to self-refer to mental health services in the future so that that process can be bypassed altogether. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to move on to the next question, otherwise Sorry. we're going to run out of time. But we will have time for questions um, afterwards. Uh, so this question is for Marnie and very good linking on to healthcare now. Uh, so it is a quite alarming to see that 35% of LGB students and 40% of uh, transgender students uh, are unable to access healthcare when they need it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to include intersex in this also. Uh, in terms of the normativity within medical practice, um, how can these people within the queer community and establish LB, LGBTIQA groups uh, with the new New Zealand combat this time of invisibility within healthcare. It's really good we've got five hours to talk about I this. I know, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> In Australia, with research that's been done, they're now saying with a reasonable level of confidence that if you put our rainbow community together, it's about 12% of the population. Can you imagine what 12% of the budget would look like for our community? <laughs> the dream is real. <laughs> we, we don't even have anywhere near 1%. Yeah. It would be a fraction of 1%. So, you know what? <laughs> That's the issue. So we come back to education and training, and you were talking about a counsellor. I am a counsellor, and just for in this room here, you know, when I hear you speaking for two things, one, because the person was um, behaving inappropriately in terms of ethics, there should have been a conversation mm. with you first mm. before your confidentiality mm. was broken, so not good practice, right, to start with. A number of years ago, we brought an expert around intersex issues to New Zealand, and he was on holiday, and he was willing to travel all around the country and provide people training for free. All he and his wife were looking for was a bed. And so many of my colleagues in smaller communities said, we don't have people like that here. You know, which just broke my heart, because I know that we're in every single community underneath every single rock in New Zealand. There is no part where our community is not. So 
You know, the issue is, is huge, but it does start with education. So here in um, Auckland, you know, there's some amazing, historic, and um, really important things going on, not just here in Auckland. We're going to hear what else is going on in the country. But I want to talk about one um, initiative in particular, and that's the medical school. So for the first time ever last year, there was a paper for fourth year medical students on sexuality and gender. It may well be the first in the world, we, we don't know. Now that paper was just going to be a one-off, so an elective paper for last year. What happened is as a result of, um, and, and lots of people in this room were involved in lecturing on the paper, three people, medical students, came up to their colleagues and their colleagues were horrified. So you're a gay person or a lesbian person or a trans person, I'm not going to say what it was, and you don't feel safe here at medical school to come out. So they did a wonderful screening of the film Intersection and came together as a medical school and went, this has to stop, and they've set up a diversity group. They went back to the board and said, this has to be part of the formal curriculum. It's not yet, but the paper is again um, in there this year, and the numbers who can take it have doubled. So, you know, I think the thing is chunking it down and then getting excited about what we are doing, because mm -hmm. it's really easy to be overwhelmed by what needs mm -hmm. to be done and what hasn't happened yet. So let's go around the room and identify any other projects that are going on, so we can do a little bit of a... <laughs> We're actually awesome and amazing and they're doing extraordinary things. So let's just go round and people talk about either what they're doing or what they know in their local communities. So we'll start with you, Christchurch. Oh, goodness. Well, I used to be in Dunedin, so you guys know I started uh, Alphabet Soup with a, uh, another person called Kerry as well and Adam, and we started this project and it was fabulous. However, we're struggling a little bit at the moment. Uh, but that is all right, we'll get through the tough times and I'm sure with some help from Rainbow Youth as well. I've been initially thinking about starting a uh, Lincoln University uh, queer group. There isn't anything there, so hopefully from this conference and from the help of Rainbow Youth, I'd be able to start one. <laughs> Yeah, Tony. I'm going to be a real pain because Tuva is looking at me with a tot, like the time, you know. Um, what I do want to do for tomorrow is we have the back of that whiteboard and what would be really great is we're going to get some whiteboard markers and we're going to write down all the names of the projects that we are involved in so that we can have a, a recognition of what we are doing right now and either, you know, put things into perspective and putting like you know the, like the name, so we'll do that tomorrow morning. If you guys can, you know, during like, if you guys come a little bit early, like five minutes early, and just write down, or even during like the lunch breaks and stuff, so that we do have that recognition. 
Yeah, instead of so, going, yeah. So quickly, the only other thing I want to say is we have to get out of the binary. So whatever, whether it's around sexuality, gender identity, and, and bust it out and expand it, and, and really have narratives that, that capture the diversity of this extraordinary community. So the next question that I'm going to ask Marnie is, um, it's really obvious to see uh, the negative effects of a cis heteronormative white-led male-dominated culture. Um, <laughs> uh, do, you, <laughs> do you have any ideas, Marnie, um, and practice, and you know, even examples on how we can uh, challenge current intersectionality uh, within society in relation to our community? Well, I am aware that we've run out of time, so I think Just, you visibility is so important. So, and, and that's not there as a requirement for all of us, but when we're able to be visible, when we're able to um, talk about the beautiful complexity and, and multi-dimensional aspects of our community is so important. And if you, you know, those of you who are in the room who are cisgendered, it's that work of allies, it's that work of making sure that that narrative is in the room as well. So all of us here have roles to play in this. Awesome.